Hi, my name is Mike, and I'm one of the pastors here at Kings Harbor. Thank you so much for joining us for this online message. Here's our hope that as you hear the word of God preached, that you would see Jesus more clearly and love him more deeply. And so over the next few moments, take notes, focus, and hear how the word of God is going to transform you. Uh, good to be with you. Uh, if you're Canadian, happy Boxing Day. Uh, if you celebrate Kwanzaa, happy Kwanzaa. If you don't like what you got, happy take it back with a bunch of other angry people who didn't like what they got. So it's the 26th. And thinking about that, um, I think there's a, there's a reality. Let me say this before I go too far. If you're in middle school, um, you guys have already jumped up and are, are headed out, but we love you and enjoy hearing about the Passover this morning. Um, when I think about the 26th of December, I, I need to confess something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off my, my, my role as a spiritual leader. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to get into my flesh as a human. Um, the 26th also is kind of like the most de- deflating day of the year. Like you built everything up, you got all this excitement, and then it's over. You got to start putting stuff back. You got to take your lights down. You got to take your tree down. This is a public service announcement for you people who don't take your tree down until February. You should probably start today. And it feels like, is this all there is? And it can even with a sermon series around the idea of Christmas and embodying Jesus, it could feel like, okay, that needs to be over. Is that all there is? Like typically in churches, the Sunday after Christmas, unless it happens to land in such a way that it's the first Sunday of the next year, just always kind of feels like, hmm. But what I'm grateful for is that we as a people who trust Jesus didn't just get hyped up for the first advent and was like, oh man, I got a sweater instead of something awesome. What you get at the first advent is you get to know your savior in a way that the prophets hoped for, that the angels, it says in first Peter, looked into, but we also get the guarantee of the second advent. And so this morning, the text that we'll look at is gonna be in Matthew 25, uh, and it's going to be uh, looking to that second advent. And if you turn in your Bible, particularly if you have an ESV, the little section heading says the final judgment. And you're like, my goodness, the day after Christmas, we're doing judgment, breathe out. What I actually hope that we see is not just this picture of judgment or the separating of the faithful versus the unfaithful, But I want you to see there's there's gonna be a phrase at the very end of the portion that we're gonna read of the way that Jesus is applying this litmus test of faithfulness amongst the people of God. And so here's our main idea. Jesus challenges us to display our new family relationships through our response to the practical needs of our brothers and sisters. And so with that in mind, here's what we'll do in verses 31 through 34. I'm going to spend some, a little bit more time talking about um, the, the importance of this second advent. And then in verses 35 through 40, I'm going to take some time to just help us see the Lord giving a measure of faithfulness for the people of God toward the people of God. And then, uh, so let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be with your people. Thank you that we are a people of expectation. We're people that um, don't just look back or don't just uh, reach a crescendo at um, the first advent, but we are looking forward to your your coming return. And in that, there's this joy and expectation and hope for us. In fact, that's the way that the scriptures think about salvation. It's not just this prayer that happened in a service. It's the ultimate day when you return and and fully consummate your rule and reign in such a way that um, our hope is secure and we know that we've been fully rescued by you. And so even looking at a text like this, Lord, I pray that it, it whets our appetite for more than just what we've already known. It's in your name we pray, amen? Matthew 25, starting in verse 31, would say this. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he'll separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, obviously there's there's more to be said there, but what I don't wanna do is rush past the epicness of what you're just seeing. 
Uh, actually, if you if we backed up some and we're reading through Matthew 24 and 25, uh, when I was on paternity leave, uh, I ended up in those chapters one morning and I was reading through them and there's something that was stirred in me because of the way that Jesus was speaking. And in fact, when I, when I came back from paternity leave, we were talking about a church that multiplies, a church that's on mission. And, and the beauty of Jesus calling his people to be faithful, even in the middle of struggle, is how Matthew 24 starts. And then it begins to move into this question where he talks about which servants will be found to be faithful and wise. And so you just have to know, uh, this is what happens in a preacher's mind. When Christmas is over, we start thinking about Easter. And so in thinking about Easter, one of the, the texts that uh, jumps out at me is that story about Jesus cursing the fig tree. Because I'm like, Jesus, leave the fig tree alone. You're about to be crucified. That, 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 it's got its own problems. But there's something about this picture of faithfulness and fruit bearing there. And then as you continue to read that chapter, you, you begin to see these parables about people that are put in a situation that will define whether they were wise or faithful. And the culmination of that is this text when Jesus says, when I return, there's going to be a moment where I'm going to look and I'm going to evaluate and I'm going to separate according to faithfulness. So this moment is epic because this is the moment for all of those who had suffered throughout history when they read this, that they're like, hey, my, my suffering wasn't foolishness because if I remain faithful on that day, I'm gonna get invited into what's been established before I ever was. That this moment is epic because there's this hope in it that, hey, the king will return and when he sits on his glorious throne with his angels, that he is going to be able to look and see those who were faithful, those who were wise, and those who kind of squandered the opportunity. And so in this moment, it's this reminder for us that there's more to come. It's this reminder for us that we are part of a people that, as I prayed before, that are a forward-looking people that have an opportunity to live in faithfulness and live in wisdom before our king that when he returns, when he separates the sheep from the goats. Like I know in our modern context that to be the goat of something is actually a good thing, but not in this context. That in this context, the, the idea of being a goat, well, one, there was that the, the biblical understanding or the, the Jewish understanding of the goat was the one that was the scapegoat, that the sins were placed upon the goat and they were sent away from the people. That it was this idea of unfaithfulness versus this innocence and faithfulness of the sheep. But for we as a people, we can stake our hope in this second advent, the return of a king that in his glory, that will not just be seen in his glory, but will actually invite us in to be part of said glory. And so if that's true, then what he says next must be of utmost importance. There are these texts in the scriptures where there are times when Jesus is about to say something that it ought to make you get on the edge of your seat, lean forward. If you are a note taker, it might make you want to like, like lick your pen. I don't know why people do that, but lick your pen and like get ready. Another one of those instances is uh, if you read the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter five, when nobody can open the scroll. Like that's a moment when you want to sit on the edge of your seat because like if this is going to be how the world's going to be made right, I need to know what's in that scroll. In the same way, if he's going to measure what faithfulness looks like, if he's going to measure, if you're my people, in between the first advent and the second advent, if you're going to know what faithfulness looks like, we ought to be like leaning forward. If you're sitting at home, you ought to like turn up the sound on your computer, lean forward, maybe rewind it back and watch it a couple of times because it feels like what Jesus is about to say next is of the utmost importance. He's going to give a measure for faithfulness and I want to know what that is. Verse 35, let's say this. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothed you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Now, I, I want to I wrestle one of just the logic of the passage. So I could just, I just know me. 
And if I'm on that great day where the Lord is sitting in his glorious throne and he's separated the sheep from the goats and he's defining you who are on the right, here's the reason that you got in because when I was sick, you came and visited me. When I was in prison, you spent time with me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. I don't know that I'm gonna be like, when did I do that, Lord? I'm just going in. Like, I'm like, I don't know when I did it, but if I, if I, if I got caught doing something right, I'll take it. Maybe it was the guy next to me and maybe we look alike and you mistook me for that guy, but I still take it. And so it's interesting that they, they push back and they say, when did we see you that way, Lord? In fact, I want to put the two images right next to each other because this, verse, this section of verses started with the king in his glory with his angels sitting on his glorious throne, judging the world with the nations in front of him. And the way that he self-defines is not by glory, but by humility. In fact, this is also a picture, again, of the first advent. My, my wife and I were laying, on, laying in bed on Christmas Eve. And that, 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 it was that moment where you get to breathe out and you're like, there's nothing else to build. And there's nobody asking you to put batteries in what you already built. And so we're laying in bed and she's like, isn't it crazy to you that Jesus had to learn how to walk? Like, isn't it crazy to you that the word became flesh and then had to learn how to talk? And like she was just talking about the, the way that uh, the, the, the reformers would say that God would condescend himself, that he would stoop down and make himself less. And so that's shocking for us because we don't see people of notoriety do that. We don't see kings making themselves less than. We don't see uh, rulers making themselves naked or hungry. That usually something went really, really bad in your leadership if you end up homeless and naked. And so for Jesus to say that here's how I'm measuring your faithfulness when you caught me this way, that had to be shocking because maybe they didn't recognize that they had done that in other ways, but it's certainly shocking to think that the king of kings on his glorious throne with this angelic army judging the nations has ever been vulnerable. And I just love that we serve a God that his power is built on his humility, not on the fact that he, could, he has this inexhaustible army, though he does. But then here's what's second that's interesting to me. They're like, we don't recognize doing this because Jesus, we didn't get to directly do this to you. Now that's certainly true for them in that moment, but think about us two millennia later. I don't, I don't know that you've had the personal opportunity to invite Jesus over and, and have dinner with him. And so it feels like for us, that would even feel impossible, not just unlikely. And so then his response is really important because his response is, well, I'll say to you that when you've done this to the, one of the least of these, you've done this for me. At least that's how I've always heard the text. If you've, always, if you've done this for one of the least of these, you've done this for me. But that's actually not what the text says. What the text says is, as you did this to one of the least of these, my brothers, you've done this for me. Now, I actually think that's significantly important. Like we're gonna, we're gonna nerd dive into English today, um, into grammar today, into punctuation today. And so if you're an English major, this is your moment. If you haven't taken grammar since like you were in sixth grade, this is also your, I don't know, it's not your moment. You just got just to deal with it. It would be one thing if the phrase read, to one of the least of these, comma, my brothers, you've done this to me. So when you do that, you're basically setting something apart as a direct address. So if I walked in and said, um, guys need help with, with moving chairs. If I just say guys need help moving, moving chairs, I'm just saying that there are some general people who need help moving chairs. If I say, guys, comma, need help moving chairs, that is moved into an imperative saying, you got to help me move these chairs. I'm talking to y'all. And so the way that this sentence seems to be structured by the translators is not that Jesus is saying to those who were the faithful, those who were the sheep, saying that you direct address my brothers, you direct address my brothers and sisters. It seems what he's saying is he's generally talking about that when you've done this for the least of my brothers and sisters, and so in Jesus' mind, the actions of caring for practical needs for those who you call family is actually one of the measures of your faithfulness. Here's how I also know this. 
Because James, who is Jesus' half-brother, would write in his letter, and he would say that if you run into somebody who has practical need and you say that you have faith, but there's no action, that's like you saying, hey, you're hungry, and I'm going to pray for you, but then walking off. And so there seems to be this practical reality, especially amongst the people of God. Now, don't hear me say that therefore you should not care or enter in with people who are not the people of God. And all the free time that I have, one of these days, one of these years, one of these seasons of life, I'm gonna write a book called Neighbors and Brothers. That's all I got is a title. But what I'm thinking through is the reality of the scriptures call us to two things. They call us this level of family, but they call us this level of neighborliness. And the more that I hear those things, the less I think they're actually all that different. But this call to brothers and sisters of the faith, that's why when we talked about the the adoption that Jesus gives us on Christmas Eve, that it wasn't just this kind of personal thing, but it's also this, this communal thing that now all of a sudden makes you my family in a way that we would have never been family. And in this moment, when Jesus is separating the faithful versus the unfaithful, the measure that he chooses to speak to is how did you care for your family? That's mind-blowing for me. And so if the the essence of this series is that um, Jesus came to embody the person and character of God in a way that we could see and know it, that we would have never seen or known, and our responsibility is to also do the same, it's really important that when he, the king of all glory, returns and says this is one of the measures that we recognize that part of the way that we embody adoption is the way that we care for one another. And that changes a lot of things. A, a man named Kevin DeYoung and, and, and another guy named Greg Gilbert wrote a book called What is the Mission of the Church? And they wrestle with this question because the reality is you can't do that for everybody. That even if in this room, if all the needs that were in the room were named and one person had to feel the responsibility of covering all the needs of everybody in the room, um, unless your last name is Gates, that's probably not happening. But there's this reality that how do we discern what we're supposed to enter into? And here's the, the rubric that they build. They build, what is your responsibility because of proximity? So um, oftentimes there will be some form of disaster in the world. Hurricanes, earthquakes, uh, tornadoes in the middle of the night that happened uh, several weeks ago in Kentucky. And at the same time, there may be direct need to people that you know, worship with, and have family with. Where's your primary responsibility? Or maybe where's your initial responsibility? They would argue that you serve the brothers and sisters that you know, and then you serve the brothers and sisters that are an extension from there. So my responsibility is to you first. In the same way that in my life, my responsibility is ultimately to my household first. Like, I, I would not be a faithful husband or dad if every week or every couple of weeks when I got my paycheck, I was like buying groceries for other people and not taking care of my own family. Now, that doesn't mean I shouldn't seek to do both. That doesn't mean I'm not called to do both. But it does mean that there is a measure of faithfulness that starts in the, the, gra- the, the greatest proximity of focus. And Jesus would call that out and say, hey, have you, have you done that well for your brothers and sisters? That for us to be family means that we have this mutual responsibility to one another. Which means I don't just happen to worship in a room with you for 90 minutes and then have no further responsibility to you. It doesn't mean, hey, if I see you outside of this place, all bets are off. It means that just like family, I have this opportunity to show the beauty of the adoption that we share together by entering in and saying that whatever burden you have is my burden. I mean, that's what makes the, the scriptures so weighty, right? Like we, we talk about the one another's all the time. And I don't, want to, I don't want you to think about that as, hey, here's some really cool statements that can go on a bookmark that you should think about someday. It's this familial responsibility It's this coat of arms that we're called to. And Jesus would say, in that moment when I'm separating from the faithful from the unfaithful, a measure of that faithfulness. So it's interesting to me and intimidating to me 
You know what's not in the list? Preaching good sermons. You know what's not in the list? Church attendance. You know what's not in the list? How much money did you give to build whatever? And none of us would say that none of those things are unfaithful. You should attend church. You should give faithfully. You should preach sermons. And if you are preaching sermons, you should probably try and preach good ones. But he would say the way that every single one of us, regardless of title, regardless of position, care for our brothers and sisters is a really clear measurement of whether you've been faithful or not. So what does that look like? How do you do that? I want to demystify that for you. And I think sometimes I, I could stand up and give a list of things, and, that's, and, and that could be helpful. We've done that at other moments in this series of, hey, here's a real practical way to enter into that. But one of the things that I, I feel like the Lord's given us the grace to do is have voices of people who are, who are doing it day in, day out, far better than I could ever describe. So here's what I want to do. I want to invite some friends to the stage, uh, Stephen and Nicole. If you don't know Stephen and Nicole, um, part of the reason why you may not know them is that Stephen and Nicole have, for the last decade, been uh, living in the Middle East, um, serving serving those who are not brothers and sisters, but also serving those who have become brothers and sisters. And so I just want to invite Stephen and Nicole to share uh, how the Lord has used them uh, because of the adoption in Christ that they've experienced with those around them. You should be good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Um, so yeah, like Mike said, we've been overseas for over 10 years now, 12 years actually, and we have the privilege of working with um, war refugees from Syria. So we've been um, able to go and live life with them in really unique ways and be intentional about going and learning the language and living among them. And that has led to some really unique opportunities and um, unique um, doors have been opened because of that. Yeah, um, what I love about the Christmas Eve service and just how we've been adopted into Christ's family, I feel like early on the Lord said to us, treat them as family. How are they going to see how Jesus' family works unless you actually show them what family looks like? And so a lot of what we do, yeah, is just um, daily you know, seemingly insignificant things, but being there and being present and showing what the family of God looks like and saying Jesus has made a way for you to be in this family. Yeah, and one, I was thinking of one guy, he sent me a text, he's in Canada now, Syrian refugee, and I met him in 2012, he had just come out of Syria, we had just come out of Syria, and we started living life with them, like we would for the next eight years, we tracked with them, and uh, his wife became part of the knitting group, and I did lots of things with him, lots of time together, um, walked through him, helping him try to find a job, kind of giving him opportunities to work, and then when that failed and when the government stopped that, just being with him when his mom died, being there at the funeral, and he sent me a text uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he said, I'm never going to forget what you did for us, the way you stood with us all those years, and how you have impacted our lives. And it just struck me, like most of what I did with him was rather insignificant. It wasn't big preaching opportunities. It was going over there late at night when he's feeling sad, or trying to think through how he could find work, and, and all those kind of things. And what that led to was a relationship, and what led to was opportunities to share. Like, I had incredible opportunities when he would ask me, what are you doing here? Like, why? Everyone's trying to get to America, and you're coming here to the Middle East. Like, why are you here? And I said, I'm here because Jesus has called us here, and he's called you to be part of the family too. So those kind of opportunities came not always from big, dramatic moments, but from the day-to-day -day being there with them. Yeah, and so as Stephen mentioned, um, we started a, a knitting group um, one, for lots of reasons, one being that it, knitting helps with trauma um, and also just that regular getting together, having a community, kind of being like an, a family 
atmosphere where we know each other's needs. We know what people are going through because we're gathering on this consistent basis. And, um, and it's been going almost 10 years. And so just walking through with the ladies, um, there were some when I would share from the word of God and there was such fear in their eyes. But our book says this about Jesus or just this need to, um, to kind of come against what they were hearing because there was such fear um, but as the years have gone on and we've walked with them, those same ladies now are sharing stories out of the Bible. Um, and so just, you know, it's a, it's a slow process, I think, wherever we are in the world, that it is that slow process, that daily faithfulness, that daily just loving on people that transforms lives. And now there are ladies that say, yes, Jesus died on the cross and he rose again and... Um, yeah, they're saying that in front of other ladies, which isn't always the safest thing. And so, um, yeah, we're just, we praise God um, for what he's doing. Um, sometimes we have, you know, it can be overwhelming if you think of everyone. We have the same thing with Syrian refugees. Um, we have 60 families in our group, and sometimes it's like crisis after crisis. They're living in crisis. Um, one lady we had, um, she's on dialysis. There was a medical error from a I think it was a nurse in, in Jordan, and it destroyed her kidneys. Young lady um, on dialysis, and her, um, her aid was just cut suddenly. She gets it three times a week, and it is $50 or JD's? Dollars. $50 each one. And so that, that adds up quickly for this lady that gets $100 a month in our knitting group. And... Um, so we, we have a prayer team, and we just sent that out immediately and um, said, everybody we know <laughs> pretty much is praying for you. Um, and it just had a huge impact. Like these people even that have never met me are praying, and, and even some people, you know, gave and said, here's for her next treatment. And we just prayed and prayed, and, and the Lord provided another organization or the same, I'm not sure, but came and said, we're going to pick back up these treatments. And so she's still getting the treatments um, to this day, praise God, yeah. Um, and yeah, we are not, we're not Bill Gates, so we can't, um, we can't always help. We had another lady uh, needed heart surgery and it's like $15,000, um, but we walked with that family. We said, we're praying for you daily. We're looking into other organizations, seeing if there's a way and um, and praise God, um, another organization, paid for her surgery and so she just got it um last month and is doing really well and so um it's not always that we can meet every need I feel like often we can't because they're just beyond but um but the being there and even the really praying not just saying we're praying but praying with them right there um sending scriptures you know really showing that we are praying I feel like there's yeah there's been a a big impact um we haven't always felt it more than once, I felt like, what are we doing here? Like, sometimes it just feels like what we're doing in the day in and day out feels so insignificant, and you don't see always changes in people in the day in and day out. And um, I felt like the Lord just really encouraged me one day and said, just your presence being here. You are the light. You have the light of Christ in you. Just being in this country um, and being that light and praying in this place is changing things. And you can't always see it. And, you know, I feel like um, the passage, like, when did we do this sometimes? But the Lord sees and uses each and every time we do something. And I've just been so, blow, been so blown away by the Lord's faithfulness to our little tiny faithfulness. Yeah, and just kind of to sum up, I, as an encouragement, like, God calls us to show up and be present. And for us, that means traveling 10,000 miles away and learning a new language. But all, he calls all of us to the same thing. Show up, um, serve, and love. And then he is the one that brings the, the fruit out of that. So um, I want to say thank you to all of you who have supported us and blessed us and prayed for us. Uh, we have a table outside if you want to come by. We have a little gift from the many ladies for everyone. So come see us after. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> so obviously there's there's a dynamic because of the nature of what they do. Uh, we always have to be careful, especially on a on a stream. So, so some of you are like I want details, right? Like if you're like me, I'm like I want details on another word. Um, and, and so one of the things that's beautiful is you can walk up to the table and have a conversation. But I also hope that it stirs something in you. Um, in March, it'll be five years since my candidate weekend. And on that weekend, I shared a quote from a guy named Antoine de Ex the Saint Exbury. And it's like, if you want people to build boats, you don't get them better tools. You don't give them better plans. You teach them the long for the vast and endless sea. And my hope is like hearing that the Lord moves in that way stirs a longing in you. My hope is that hearing that, man, I can do ordinary things to the glory of God for brothers and sisters that are around me or for people that I'm longing for the Lord to adopt. And he can move in that. And he can use that, not because I have special skills, not because I'm the, the, the most articulate person or, or because I, I have the most Bible knowledge or I, I've got um, just this immense gift that's gonna gather people to come towards me, but I'm gonna be faithful and, and sit with a brother who's lost a job or lost a family member and help them find a job, help them say, hey, here's how you can find your skills. Uh, there's a, a man named Doug Mendenhall who when I lived in Dallas at one season, um, he sat and just painstakingly went through every dot and line of my resume and Sky's resume to help us as young adults become more professional because he loved the church and he loved us. And, and he is a part of the legacy of what the Lord's built in our lives because he was willing to do what he had that felt really ordinary to f impact the lives of others. So my prayer is when you hear Stephen and Nicole, that it stirs this longing. You're going to hear that word longing a lot here in the days to come. In fact, our next series, Hunger and Thirst, is about stirring a longing for the Lord to move in a way that we should be filled. And I hope the Lord's beginning to do that even throughout this series. Like, Lord, I can practically do that. I can lean into that. I can, I can do that tomorrow. So here's what I want to do. In a moment, we're going to step into communion together. But I want to give us some space to pray before we go to the table. That if Jesus is saying, this is a measure of faithfulness, how you have engaged the, the practical needs of your brothers and sisters, near and far. So we have an honest heart check about how we're doing with that. We have the honest moment where we go before the Lord and say, Man, I, I'm a little challenged here. A few messages ago, one of the things I mentioned is sometimes it's really hard to see the needs of others when we don't have margin. Maybe you're like me, and as you get ready to, to turn the calendar, you, you're, kind of, you're goal-oriented, and so you're like, in the first quarter, I'm going to do this. In the second quarter, I'm going to do this. Or, or, or maybe you're more goal-oriented on that. Day one, I'm doing this. Day two, I'm doing this. And, and maybe that's the way the Lord's wired you. But what if, what if a goal was not to be more productive, but to be more available? Lord, give me the margin that when somebody is hungry, or thirsty, or naked, or imprisoned, or sick, or has nowhere to stay, that I, I can slow down enough to see it. And then maybe it's not that you're not available. Maybe you're like, Lord, I don't feel like I have the resources because I feel like I'm the one that needs it. And I pray that the Lord would remind you that you're seen, but I also pray that what we talked about earlier in the series, that you would be part of the abundance that Jesus provides in every facet of your life, where you don't stay in a place of need. And so I just want to take a few minutes and pray. And I want to give, give you the chance to go before the Lord and slow down and make space to say, Lord, I long for this. I heard that. And I, and I hear where I'm being challenged in the word. And that because uh, I'm, I'm somebody who has been a recipient of the gospel, and, and I, don't want our, I don't want the gospel to be so truncated that it's just I got forgiven of my sins and that's it. You get adopted into a family. You're a member of a kingdom and the kingdom is ever coming more and more and the way that you live begins to flesh that out. And so what does it look like as a member of this kingdom for me to be faithful? I wanna give you just a few moments to pray and then I'll, I'll bring us out of it. So Jesus said, pray. 
in the same way you as a good and faithful older brother would come in humility and in service towards us? Would you make that true for us towards others? Lord, I, I, it's, it is profound to me that they didn't even know that they had done it. They get this promise of entering into a kingdom that was established long before them. And when they hear that, in that, that um, affirmation that they're in, they, they're, they're shocked because it was just ordinary obedience. It was just mundane faithfulness to, to enter into what was right before them. Lord, would you help us to do the same? Would you help me to do the same? Would you, would you build margin in my days where just as Nicole said that not just, hell yeah, I'll pray for that, but like to slow down and really enter in, to, to take up the need in the ways that I can when, when, when that's within my, my, the grace that you've given me to do. Would you do that amongst us? Would that mark us this next year? Would there just be this, oh, hey, we did that for the least of your brothers and sisters, Lord. Would we be marked by this, this humble entering in and in when we can? And then, Lord, I pray that we'll look back and you'll begin to say that that was faithful and that was wise. And, and I moved in that and, and, and you could see my grace all over this and the, and the kingdom was revealed through that. And we'll be shocked and just like they were like, when, how? Are you sure that was us? Give us a longing for that. Because if we long for it, our eyes will be, uh, will be searching for it. Our hearts will run towards it. Our, our hands will engage in it. So make, make that a marker for uh, your people, that we are people who love those who you've adopted into your family well. It's in your matchless name I pray. Amen. Amen. Again, thanks for watching this message online. And here's our hope, that you didn't just hear the Word of God, but that it compels you to follow the way of Jesus. Here's what we mean by that. We're not just giving you information, but we believe that there's steps that you take afterwards to obey Jesus, to serve the world around you, to give sacrificially, and to go to others who haven't heard the message. And so one, we would love to know you, particularly if you're in the Southern California area. If you go to kingsharbor.org slash hello, you can send us a digital connect card and we would love to follow up with you and just get to know you better. But we also hope that you didn't just hear a message and then just stow it away somewhere, but it compels you to obey and follow the way of Jesus. Uh, we pray that you do that in community. That's the best way to live this out. You can live it out. We just don't believe you should live it out alone. Uh, on top of that, we, we believe that this is an opportunity to serve. And whether that's you serving uh, the church or the community around you, that those who follow Jesus reflect Jesus by the way that they serve. And then we would ask that you give. Giving is not something that is uh, just kind of a tradition in the church. It's evidence that you fully trust Jesus in every dimension of your life. And then finally, we're praying that you go that you would share this with someone else, that if the Lord has impacted you by his word to see Jesus better and love him more deeply, that you'd invite others to do the same by either sharing this message with them or entering into community with them and sharing what the Lord has done. So we're excited to hear from you, to connect with you, and to hear about what the Lord is doing through his word and in your life.